in the family of trig functions, we also have what are called inverse trig functions. And so in this video, we're going to look at inverse trig functions. Now, these are not the same thing as reciprocal functions. Reciprocals take fractions and turn them upside down. Inverses undo the original functions. Those are two different things. So to remind you what an inverse is, let's just look at three equations. Uh, we'll start with the square root of x plus 3 equals 4. Now, if we wanted to solve this equation, we would have to apply the inverse. And the inverse of a square root is a square. So to do this, what we would do is on both sides, we would put a square. So I'm going to actually do that first. I'm going to write something in parentheses squared equals something in parentheses squared, and then drop in that original function. So on the left, inside of the parentheses, I'll put the square root of x plus 3. And on the right, inside the parentheses, I'll put 4. So this reads as left parentheses, square root of, all under the square root, x plus 3, right parentheses, and then a square on the outside, equals left parentheses 4, right parentheses squared, right? It's a very complicated way to say we square both sides and get x plus 3 equals 16, because 4 squared is 16. We can then solve from there. Let's look at the next one. e to the x plus 2 equals 5. Now again, we can undo this function by applying its inverse. And the inverse of e to the is ln of. So we're going to do a natural log on both sides. Again, I'm going to do that part first. So I'm going to write natural log of left parentheses and then leave a space right parentheses equals natural log of left parentheses and then leave a space right parentheses. I'm going to drop in the equation above. So in that set of parentheses on the left, I'm going to write e to the x plus 2. And in that set of parentheses on the right, I'm going to write 5. So what I see now is the natural log of left parentheses e to the x plus 2 right parentheses equals the natural log of left parentheses 5 right parentheses. Again, just a very complicated way of saying that I now have x plus 2 equals the natural log of 5. And I can solve from that. I would just subtract 2 from both sides. Now this final equation, sine x equals 1 half, we really need a way to undo sine. We need like an inverse sine, right? And an inverse sine might be written like, uh, in our inverse notation, we would use f negative 1. And in sine notation, we might write sine negative 1. So what I'm going to do is in that same uh, way I did the last two, I'm going to write sine negative 1 of left parentheses, right parentheses, and then equals on the other side, sine negative 1 of left parentheses, right parentheses. That negative 1 sits like it's in an exponent. It's not truly an exponent. It's just the notation for inverse sine. And then inside those parentheses, I'm going to drop the original equation. So I'm going to put in sine x on the left side inside the parentheses and 1 half in the right side in the parentheses. So reading it out, I would have inverse sine of left parentheses, sine x, right parentheses, equals inverse sine of left parentheses, 1 half, right parentheses. Now, if we can truly find this inverse, then my next step would be to write x equals inverse sine of 1 half. And we would be able to solve it from there because we would have removed the x from the sine function. So that's the idea behind inverse trig functions. If we wanted to think about what sine x equals 1 half means, what we're saying here is that x is the angle with a sine value. I'm going to write that S-I-N-E value of 1 half. And tan x equals 1 would say x is the angle with a tangent value. I'm going to write out the word tangent, T-A-N-G-E-N-T, -E value of 1. And cosine t equals 0.68 would say that t is the angle with a cosine, C-O-S-I-N-E, value of 0 0.68. Now the one tricky thing here is that an angle can be either in radians or degrees. 
So if we were to actually solve these, we would have to be careful to know whether our answer was in radians or degrees. And that depends on what your calculator is set for, which is why you always have to pay attention to whether your calculator is in radians or degrees. Now the problem with finding a specific inverse is that when we look at periodic functions, they're gonna have an infinite number of solutions because the graphs repeat. For example, we could mark all the places on this graph where tangent x equals one. I'm gonna grab a ruler, I'm gonna plot a line here at tangent x equals one, using my pencil right there. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of places where tangent x equals one. Every time tangent crosses this line I drew at y equals one, I have a solution. There's an infinite number of solutions. Now, where are those solutions? Well, if you remember, tangent is one where sine and cosine are equal to each other because sine over cosine is the same. And that happens at pi over four, it happens again at five pi over four. It happens again at nine pi over four, again at 13 pi over four, etc. So it's repeating and there's lots of answers. We could write all those answers by looking at that repeat. We essentially have one, five, nine, 13, etc. And so it's like every four pi over four that this happens. To write this answer, we could just look at what we're adding each time. Every time we move one to the left, we are actually adding four pi over four or one pi. So between the first and second answer on here, between pi over four and five pi over four, we're adding four pi over four or adding pi to it. And then we go to the next one. Again, we're adding pi to it. And to get to the next one, we're adding pi to it. So uh, what we really have for answers here are x equals pi over four plus n pi, where n is an integer. So we have pi over four plus one pi, pi over four plus two pi, pi over four plus three pi, get it? Every pi, we can add another one.